Rural folk, what is the most creepy thing you've seen or experienced? Part 6. Please make sure you share and subscribe us. Account 1. We live on 5.5 acres in the middle of nowhere. We see shadow people all the time. We ignore them, but it's creepy as hell. Thankfully, we bought a house in town and we are moving in a few weeks. Edit. We see black figures all the time, especially in our home. It's 125 years old, so lots of families have lived here. We ignore them. They are usually in the kitchen because the living room is not part of the original home. My oldest has woken up to a black figure standing in the corner of his room. He will put his earbuds in and close his eyes and ignore it. They have never tried to harm us, but they make it known they are there. We hear knocking on the bathroom door while showering. It's loud and our bathroom is right off the kitchen, but again, we ignore it. Stuff goes missing all the time. We are packing up our house and have yet to find anything that we have lost. Nothing really unusual outside. But sometimes our car lights will go on like someone unlocked the cars, but our keys are hanging up and we go outside and the cars are locked. Just weird random stuff. Account 2. Driving down a remote hill road commonly called the shortcut to the locals, called that because it went straight up a massive set of hills and straight down. It was carved and made by local people to avoid having to go all the way around, which was a solid extra 30 minutes depending on construction, logging, the local gravel, soil company, etc. Well, this route is about 10 minutes long if you're going the average 50 mph that people usually did, but I felt weird about the road that night. It was about 1 p.m. I was heading home from a long trip I spent with some friends, and I was alone. It didn't feel right. I hadn't taken the route much prior to that, but I was tired and didn't want to waste time getting home. So I'm driving down the road at about 30 manamater per hour, and I notice a slight orange-bronze haze coming just above the nearby trees on my left. I figured it was a car, but the road curved to the right at that place and went straight from there, so there couldn't be any headlights coming from that direction. I slowed down, thinking maybe someone had gone off the road, but I couldn't see the origin of the lights. Deciding it's best not to be the curious, stupid person in budget horror movies who checks something out alone, I just pulled my handgun from my holster and set it on the center console, just in case. I slowed to a stop as I came up to the curve so I wouldn't move away from the lights. That's when I found out the lights were moving, ever so slightly at first, then gained some speed, kind of diagonally towards me, but would have passed me. That's when I saw it peek through the trees, it's hard to describe outside of miniature electrical sun. The best representation I've seen is the electrical anomaly in Metro 2033. Imagine that, but orange and more fiery than electrical. It moved through the trees, and I noticed it would sort of stick an arm out to touch the trees it passed, like a little lightning arm. It would start a little fire whenever it touched something, but seeing as these were all giant live pines, and it was a rather wet area, a valley between two hills, and fires don't start on live wood easily, the fires would go out pretty quickly on their own. Then it struck some dead birch trees, and oh boy did those light up quick. This seemed to give it more energy, and it sped up and avoided a couple more trees before smacking straight into a big great oak. It blew up like a grenade and disappeared, and set that side of the oak on fire. I called the fire department because that wasn't going out anytime soon. Fast forward a bit, they put it out relatively easily. It hadn't grown much, and they had one of those big off-road brush fire trucks. Police came and questioned me. They thought I started the fire, that I committed arson. Mid-question, a dude from the FD rolls up and says there's lightning scarring on some of the trees and in the dirt, and that it wasn't arson. And the fire followed a specific path that didn't include a lot of dry stuff. After a confusing hour of back and forth, they chalked it down to a destructive event of ball lightning. That remains my only experience with it, and I'm glad I haven't seen it since. That thing is scary. Account 3. No one will ever believe it, but my friends and I encountered a Wendigo while camping on the Appalachian Trail in 1998 or 1999. There were three of us. We were in the tent, all of us asleep when we hear heavy footsteps like a horse, and the air goes from warm and humid to shivering cold. I could see my breath. The tree frogs, crickets, whip poor wills all just stopped making noise. The moonlight cast a shadow of a short, gangly figure about four feet tall walking by the side of the tent. Hoofed feet, skinny arms, long fingers like Freddy Krueger, 
and what appeared to be small antlers. Its labored breathing was all I could hear until I heard one of my buddies whisper, What the fuck is this? You seeing this shit? The unmistakable stench of roadkill filled the air. Then it started fumbling with the zipper of the tent. After a few seconds, there was a low guttural growl, almost like frustration. I swear to God, it said, let me in. My buddy grabbed a road flare, lit it, and busted out of the tent screaming, get the hell out of here. We didn't see anything but movement in the bushes. Then the tree frogs and night jars went back to making their usual racket. The whole rest of the trip, it felt like something was following us. Account four. This is a bit of a long one and it's about camping. I've mostly lived in cities. Friend and I were on a road trip around the American Southwest. We camp at this isolated state park about 45 minutes away from Zion National Park. Night one, tent pole breaks when we try to set it up. My friend's tent was the kind with the poles already in a sheath on the tent, so you just had to extend them. We drive 45 minutes into town to buy duct tape, come back, and all the poles in our tent have been flipped inside out. There are other people around, but nobody fesses up to messing with it. Some people come and help us with repairs and offer us dinner. I'm a gay man, and my friend is a woman, so I just didn't want to answer questions from anybody in rural Utah. My friend goes to dinner anyway. A person in a different group said he hated foreigners, so I felt uncomfortable being another minority. Spends time with the family's seven-year-old son, tells them she and I are married for some reason. Next day, I'm a wreck, I'm exhausted, and assuming these people are gonna attack us or mess with us more. No proof they did, but the tent situation was so weird. We get back and quickly go to bed, avoiding all of our campsite neighbors. That night I hear sticks breaking near our tent. You can hear the wind howling for a solid minute before it hits our tent each time, and it's a full moon. At about 3 a.m., a pack of coyotes walk through the camping ground, hooting and hollering and howling at the moon. I literally felt like I was going insane, was so tired. The whole thing felt so surreal. Next morning, my friend says she had a nightmare that the family's young son was at our door asking to come in because he was scared. She knows vampire lore and knew something was off, so she didn't invite him in and said his voice got demonic and he was clawing at the door in the tent screaming. She also said that was the most real feeling nightmare she's ever had. Needless to say, the next morning we got up and never looked back. Account five. I was once on a farm sleeping in a camping tent with my best friend. He wakes me up and goes, bro, I have to pee. But we were far from the house, like in the middle of the forest. I say, just pee on the grass or whatever. And he answers, look at the fire pit. We'd made one before going to sleep. I look and there are two gigantic creepy shadows being projected on the tent. We panic, but we calm each other to sleep. An hour or so later, he wakes me up again and he's crying saying, bro, I'm gonna die. I can't hold my pee. The shadows are still out there. They're like seven feet tall. Maybe my 12-year-old mind exaggerated that. We cry ourselves to sleep again, but he's almost pissing himself. 20 minutes later, we're awake again because he obviously couldn't hold it. The shadows are gone. We get out of the tent and he wants to go to the house to pee. It's a mile away, but he'd already pissed his pants a little, so that gave us a little more time. We walk through this forest with a souvenir flashlight for minutes. Years later, I realize how stupid and lucky we were. There were like six snakes per inch there, but we made it to the house. We are getting close when we look the opposite way. There's a soccer field and there they were, the same two giant scary shadows wandering around at 3 a.m. Why not? We sprint full speed to the house, enter the bathroom together and start panicking again. He can't hold the pee. I just turn around and he pees as quietly as possible. He gets up, we hug, he didn't wash his hands to be quiet, pretty gross now I see, and try not to cry. But we hear footsteps outside the house. The door knocks. We are shivering but quiet, not a single word or sound. Who's in there, says the voice outside the door. We hear a key. It's turning the lock, it unlocks the door. We are crying, hugging as hard as we can, praying, and the door opens. It's the homeowner, his uncle. We were so panicked we forgot he was there. We tell him everything, we cry, we stutter and sob, but we ask him to go outside. He sighs and says, fine. When he opened the door, we got in shock because he looked surprised. The surprised expression slowly turns into a laughing face as he was realizing something. It was really creepy. We ask what's up. He goes, 
The horses broke the fence and escaped. We go with him, take a look, and there were two horses in front of the house. They were his uncles. We laugh nervously and sleep in the house. Biggest doof in my life. Account six. My parents' old home was in the boonies, but we were in a neighborhood, just the houses were super spaced out. Anyway, my grandmother lived in a little cottage in the back of the land, and about a year before she died, she kept telling us that someone was breaking into her house and moving things. Now she was really damaged with cancer at the time and my parents figured that was causing her to imagine things. But she kept swearing things were moving when she would come back to the house. Dad checked the house. No sign of forced entry. Nothing. Flash forward two years and my brother moves in. Everything's great and then his new puppy starts getting really sick. One day he comes home and sees that the puppy is in his kennel, but he threw up and inside his kennel is my brother's high school letterman jacket from his closet. Then, a few days later, a blanket from his bed is across the room. He didn't do it. The dog in the kennel didn't do it. But no forced entry, nothing. Flash forward another year. First brother moves out. Second moves in. Then it really kicks up a notch. Someone moved a photo from his fridge to his sink, reorganized his room, turned his TV around. My brother is a little rough around the edges, so he decides he wants to booby trap the house. That's illegal, so instead, he places a tiny line of flour on the inside of each door walkway. Comes home one day, and there are footprints coming in and out of the house. And one night, we chased a shadowy figure off the land. We changed the locks several times. My dad is a cop, and he said, unfortunately, because nobody has done anything wrong, they can't quite file a report. They eventually installed floodlights and cameras, but I guess whoever was doing it decided no more. It would all be a funny experience if... A, they weren't harassing an old sick lady. B, we think they're the reason the dog got sick because he went to another home after and they never had any issues. And C, I don't care who you are. Don't break into people's houses. Account 7. I lived out by Lake Tahoe, a beautiful place, but I watched after the house with my dad. I was maybe six at that time, and my dad always tells me there's this part of the house where it goes from 68 to 43, and it was really creepy to him and me, and you could hear walking. Account 8. Not too far into the foothills of California, went for a longish day hike, didn't plan on being gone for more than a couple of hours. I went a little farther than I would usually go. Up higher in the hills, I turned a corner I wouldn't normally turn and found a deer skeleton. Like complete head, spine, ribs, pelvis, and limbs. That wasn't especially disturbing. What I didn't like was seeing the baby deer skeleton next to it. Account 9. There are a couple of times that come to mind. We own about 9 acres and the shape is a little odd. It's kind of long and slanty with a ravine and creek in the middle. The house is at the front half and the pastures are at the back. So there's a dirt, clay, gravel road through the dense forest down the ravine, over the creek, and back up to where the horses are. I usually walk because the more I drive on the road, the more maintenance it needs, and I'm sort of lazy. The first creepy experience was when I was walking down to feed the horses, and it was getting close to dusk. I was by myself, but the forest was pretty quiet and peaceful. I sneezed, and in a thicket to my left, something made a similar noise, but it was not human. It was a deeper-pitched, snortier sneeze sound. I didn't like that at all at the time, but I assume now I startled a deer or something. The other time I was walking in the same area with my husband, but it was nighttime. At night it gets super dark being a rural forest, so we had flashlights. As we're walking along and talking, we hear the weirdest noise way up in the tops of the tulip poplars above our heads. It sounded like some strange monkey laughing, but deeper and slower than any monkey I've heard. You could also hear the sound of something big jumping from branch to branch. We tried shining the flashlights up there, but we couldn't see that high in the trees. We left pretty quick and have never heard it again. I tell myself that we startled a flock of wild turkeys, but that was definitely the creepiest experience. Account 10. I grew up on a large farm, 100 acres of farmland and an additional 40 of woods. When I turned 17, I decided I was going to join the military the day after graduation, but I wanted to be prepared. So I started getting up at 4.30 in the morning and running the perimeter of the property. I did this every day from June through mid-October, and I was getting lean and strong and ready. I was getting to the point that I felt like I could do the run twice without exhaustion. On October 17th, all that changed. I started my run at 4.30 like normal. I got to the rear corner of the lot, 
literally the furthest point from home on my run, and I turned the corner. My right foot came down in a dugout hole. I felt my ankle break and my hip popped in a weird way that makes me want to vomit just thinking about it. I collapsed in a heap, falling on something sharp that cut straight through my sweatpants and into my leg, and my orbital bone hit a rock, knocking me out. I woke up some time later. The only thing I can tell you is that it was still dark. I did a self-inventory, physically touching all my injuries, hip, ankle, cut leg, smash face. My vision in my right eye was blurry, but still good. I quickly assessed that standing wasn't an option. Waiting for someone wasn't an option either because, for reasons, I had never told my parents what I was doing. The only option I had was to crawl. So crawl I did. It was easily 100 yards of crawl through hard, frozen, uneven fields with the remaining stalks of, I want to say, but I'm not sure, corn after harvest. Every inch was excruciating. I was about halfway through the crawl when I saw the coyotes, first one, then two. They kept a good distance, but were clearly curious. I remembered what my grandpa said about wild animals. They don't want to fight, they just want dinner. I couldn't be big, so I decided to be noisy. Every pull forward, I would growl loudly, and this kept them at bay. By the time I got to the driveway, it was fully light. I saw my parents' car was gone. They hadn't even realized I didn't get up and leave for school. I crawled the rest of the way to the house, somehow got the door open, crawled into the kitchen, used the broom to knock the phone down, and called 911. I woke up at least a day later in the hospital. My ankle was held together with a metal plate and screws. My hip had to be surgically placed back in the socket. My face was black and blue, and I have a permanent crease where the stone hit my orbital bone. And my hopes of escaping to the military were gone. Account 11. Stopped at a crossroad in the middle of nowhere to check my phone. Looked up to see someone running towards my car at full speed. I slammed on the gas pedal and saw him still running after me and waving in the rear view mirror, keeping in mind that this was miles away from the nearest town or farm in the middle of some backwoods forest at 3 a.m. in the morning. I guess it's the strangest thing. Account 12. Deer will sometimes follow people through the woods. They stay hidden, but you can hear their feet barely rustling things behind you, keeping pace with you. Humans being slow walkers in animal terms. Eventually, the deer will decide now, make a bit more noise, and step out behind you into whatever path you've been walking and show themselves, becoming very still. They want you to see them at just this distance, far enough that they have time to run if you attack, but close enough for a good look. It's eerie to hear them following. It's sort of like, is there something back there or not? Then when they decide it is time for you to get a look, now you know something is behind you. There's a sense of dread that now you have to turn around and see what it is. It's unnerving the first few times. It is amazing to see a full-grown deer maybe 30 feet behind you, very still, just looking at you, unafraid. Ironically, the deer is now controlling the situation, not what you'd expect. You look at the deer. The deer looks at you, and then the deer kind of decides that you aren't worth their time and stalks off into the woods. The first few times this happens, it is creepy as hell. After that, you know what you are most likely hearing, and it's kind of fun. You do have to have good hearing to be aware of it and know when to look back. Some people never hear them and just miss the whole show. It is an interesting instinct that many larger prey animals will follow predators who are not in hunting mode and are moving away from them. It's well documented in several prey species. It may be their way of better identifying individual predators and understanding their movements. Account 13. Grandpa hunting for the Thanksgiving turkey with my dad and uncle when they were both kids. Their dog ran ahead and stopped to bark and call them over. When they caught up to the dog, they found a car at the bottom of a cliff. The car had crashed over the edge, and the guardrail went right through the windshield and into the driver's head. The dog thought the rail looked like a toy and started to pry it out. He succeeded, and the man's brain was on the end of that stick when the dog pulled it free. Account 14. Female co-worker, late 50s, living alone on a farm. Goes out to collect the eggs one evening and is walking back to the house with her basket. A man emerges from some tall grass, soaking wet. He holds her up at gunpoint and demands that she give him her truck, keys, and a change of clothes. She agrees and asks him to hold her basket while she unlocks the door. 
It's already unlocked and there's a baseball bat right behind the door. So she whips it open, grabs the bat, and disarms the man. His instinct not to drop the eggs in the basket saved her. She called the police. He was on the run. Account 15. I lived in rural Colorado. My mother was a teacher at a school 20 minutes away from home. Sometimes I'd help her in the classroom after hours. One night we were heading home after dark. There aren't many lights in general, so it was very easy to see a green orb shoot up into the sky a few miles ahead of us. I would have written it off as a firework had it not zigzagged and shot off in another direction. It was very fast, but the movement really didn't look right. I looked over at my mom after it happened, and she looked surprised and asked me if I saw that. We never really talked about it again. I may ask her if she remembers it when I call tomorrow.